Hello! Today I prepared some new book for us to read and to start reading and get engaged and get interested and also I was thinking why not add some structure into my nar narration. Well, let's try it out. I want to show you the author that I had been underestimating for some time and but after reading just this uh, short piece of um, his writing I what did I do? I said like, wow, he's so modern, that's so great, he's writing about. So, I want to present you Sorry Merced Moem, Up at the Villa. Up at the Villa is rather small because it's just a half of this book. But it has got all the features that are such his, <laughs> um, because I've already read some more of Moem. And found all these features there. So, uh, what can I say about this? Um, his writing style, especially in at the beginning, at the very beginning, was the most problematic place, the place where some people think, ah, that's shit, I won't read it, or wow, that's great, I will enjoy it until the end. So, that's the place where people decide to read or not to read. In this place, um, I uh, read him as a very classic, like, I don't know, uh, mm, David Copperfield, or something like this, <laughs> or Jane Austen. Um, and actually, to tell you the truth, I don't much appreciate that because um, in the in this time, 18th century novels, writers, uh, it seemed like they were God and they could um, drive into the people's heads and tell us the th thoughts they think, the feelings they, they are feeling. And it was very God-like that we are and out in the situation and inside into their feelings it may be very comfortable to understand the whole situation but uh, it doesn't seem to me extremely comfortable uh, after reading Hemingway he uh, he um, presented the situation as if we were just people nearby and we could we could perceive from the book only what other as um, as other people we can see what are they doing how do they look like what the expression is on their face but we can we may not go into their heads and this is natural, that's why his style, I think, the perfect one. But we are not talking about Hemingway, though he's one of my best favorite writers. Very. We are talking about Moem. He starts classic. Uh, um, I don't know, dedicating just passages to the appearance of main characters. I may be a bad person myself, but I think I don't care what color are there his eyes. I don't care what stage he poses. Come on, um, give me some, give me some action. Give me something that um, the uh, the character does that may characterize him. So that's why I thought Moem is oh pff, classic. <laughs> At the very worst of this classic that we can read 100 pages of the book and see the description of the forest. The, how much does, how much is his income or something like that. 
of course, a real classic is not like this, but we are, we're all at school. <laughs> and I don't know, from my memories of school, it's only these huge, meaningless to small people uh, descriptions. Uh, we, uh, we had problems with some literature pieces because we missed all the interesting stuff. And the interesting stuff is how people behave, what, what decisions do they take. That's it. So, I would love uh, to start with a classic piece, the first chapter. Uh, then we'll go the real piece, the second chapter. And then we'll go the passion piece. The villa stood on the top of a hill. From the terrace in front of it you had a magnificent view of Florence. Behind was an old garden with few flowers but with fine trees, hedges of cut box, grass walks and an artificial grotto in which water cascaded with a cool silvery sound from the corn cornucopia. The house had been built in the 16th century by a noble Florentine whose impoverished descendants had sold it to some English people, and it was they who had lent it for a period to Mary Penton. Though the rooms were large and lofty, it was of no great size and she managed very well with the three ther servants they had left her. It was somewhat scantily furnished with fine old furniture and had an air, and though there was no central heating, so that when she arrived at the end of March, it had been still bitterly cold. Le Leonards, its owners, had put in the bathrooms and it was comfortable enough to live in it. It was June now and Mary spent most of the day when she was at home on the terrace from which she could see the domes of towers of Florence or in the garden behind. For the first few weeks of her stay, she had spent much time seeing the sights. She passed pleasant mornings in Uffizi and Bargello. She visited the churches and wandered at random in old streets. But now she seldom went down to Florence, except for lunch or to dine with friends. She was satisfied to lounge about the garden and read books. And if she wanted to go out, she preferred to get into the Fiat and explore the country roundabout. Nothing could have been more lovely with its sophisticated innocence that that Tuscan scene, when the fruit trees were in blossom and when the poplars burst the, into leaf, their fresh color crying around, aloud amid the great evergreen of the olives, she had felt the lightness of spirit she had thought never to feel again. After the tragic death of her husband a year before, after the anxious month, months when she had to be always on hand in case the lawyers who were gathering together what was left of his squad squandered fortune who wanted to see her. She had been glad to accept the Leonard's offer of this grand old house so that she could rest her nerves and consider what she should do with her life. After eight years of extravagant living and an unhappy marriage, she found herself at the age of 30 with some fine pearls and an income just large enough to, with rigid economy for her support. Well, that was better than it had looked at first when the lawyers with glum faces had told her that after the debts were paid, they were afraid that nothing would be left at all. At this moment, with two and a half months in Florence behind her, she felt that some, she could have faced even the, that prospect with serenity. When she left England, the lawyer, an old man and an old friend had patted her hand. No, you have got nothing to worry about, my dear, he said, except to get back your health and strength. I don't say anything about your looks because nothing affects them. You're a young woman and a very pretty one, and I have no doubt you will marry again. But don't marry for love next time. It's a mistake. Marry for position and companionship. <laughs> she laughed. She had had a bitter experience and had no intention then of ever hazarding again the risks of well wedlock. It was odd that now she was contemplating doing exactly what the shrewd old lawyer had advised. 
It looked indeed as though she would have to make up her mind that very afternoon. Edgar Swift was even then on his way to the villa. He had called up a quarter of an hour before to say that he had unexpectedly to go to Cannes to meet Lord Seafair and was starting at once but urgently wanted to see her before he went. Lord Seafair was the Secretary of State of India and this sudden summons could only mean that Edgar was after all, going to be offered the distinguished position upon which he had set his heart. Sir Edgar Swift, case CSI, was the Indian Civil Service, as her father had been, and he had had a distinguished career. He had been for five years governor of the Northwest Provinces, and during a period of great unrest had conducted himself with conspicuous ability. He had finished his term with the reputation of being the most capable man in India. He had proved himself a great administrator, though resolute, he was tactful, and if, and if he was temper... Te no! Peremptory. He was also generous and moderate. The Hindus and the Muslims liked and trusted him. Mary had known him all her life. When her father died, still a young man, she and her mother had returned to England after Edgar Swift, whenever he came home on leave, spent a great part of his time with them. As a child, he took her to the pantomime or the circus, and the girl in her teens to the pictures or the theatre. He, he sent her presents for her birthday, and at Christmas, when she was 19, her mother had said to her, I wouldn't see too much of Edgar if I were you, darling. I don't know if you have noticed, He's in love with you. Mary laughed. He's an old man. He's 43, her mother answered tartly. Um, but he had given her some beautiful Indian emeralds when two years later she married Matthew Panton and when he had discovered that her marriage was unhappy, he had been wonderfully kind. On the expiration of his term as governor, governor, he had gone to London and finding she was in Florence, he had come down to pay her a brief visit. He had stayed a week after, after week and Mary would have been a fool not to see that he was waiting for the favorable moment to ask her to marry him. How long he had been in love with her? How long had he been in love with her? Looking back, she thought it was ever since she was 15 when he had come home on leave and found her no longer a child, but a young girl. It was rather, it was rather touching, that long fidelity, and of course there was difference between a girl of 19, the man of 43, and the woman of 30, the man of 54. 54! <clears throat> the dis Parity seemed much less, and he was no longer an unknown Indian civilian, he was a man of consequence. It was absurd to suppose that the government would be content to dispense with his services. She was certainly designed to hold, he was certainly designed to hold position of increasing importance. Mary's mother was dead too now. She had no other relations in the world. There was no one for whom she was so fond of as Edgar. I wish I could make up my mind, she said. He couldn't be long now. She wondered whether she, could, she should receive him in the drawing room of the villa mentioned in the guidebooks for its frescoes by the younger Girlandaio with his stately Renaissance furniture and its magnificent candelabra, but it was a formal, sumptuous room and she felt it would give the occasion of an awkward solemnity. It would be better to wait for him on the terrace, where she was fond of sitting toward evening to enjoy the view, of which he, she never tired. Uh, it seemed a little more casual. If he were really going to ask her to marry him, well, it would make it easier for both of them uh, out in the open air over the cup of tea while she was nibbling a scone. The setting was seemly and not 
and dully romantic. There were orange trees in tubs and marbles, sarcophagi brimming over with gaily mountain flowers. The terrace was protected by an old stone balustrade on which at intervals were great stone vases and on each end uh, a somewhat battered statue of a baroque saint. Mary lay down in a long cane chair and told Nina, the maid, to bring tea. Another chair waited for Edgar. There was not a cloud in the sky, and the city below in the distance was bathed high in the soft, clear brilliance of the June afternoon. She heard a car drive up. A moment later, Hiro, the Leonard's <coughs> manservant and Nina's husband, ushered Edgar on the terrace. Tall and spare in his well cut blue serge and black homber. No idea. Um, he looked both athletic and distinguished. Even had she not known, Mary would have guessed that he was a good tennis player, a fine rider, and an excellent shot. Taking off his hat, he displayed a thick head of black curling hair, hardly touched with grey. His face was bronzed by the Indian sun, a lean face with a strong chin and antique nose. His brown eyes under the heavy brows were deep set and vigilant. Fifty-four didn't look a day more than forty-five. A handsome man of the prime of time, he had dignity without arrogance. He inspired you with confidence. There was a fellow whom no predicament could perplex and no accident discompose. He wasted no time on small talk. Mm -hmm. Well, well, well. As what I said, a um, big description of the house. A big description of a man. No description of a girl. That was really good. It is like all the habits of a long 300 pages novels are here at their place in composition long descriptions of outwards and long descriptions of houses everything is in a place and i was going to to decide that oh my god it is another piece of an 18th century but come on he and the Hemingway were talking about just the same periods of time. So, maybe next time, in the second chapter, there will be something more interesting than that. <laughs>